We're gonna talk about comics from Devil's Jew. It's something you wondered if Talking Joe would ever do. I guess we'll explain it all to you. Gonna take some time to read the books we've never read. Oh. Hey, 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 everybody. The declassified class is in session with me, Mark, and welcome to Talking Joe, the best and longest running dedicated G.I. Joe comics pun podcast. Um, if you are new to the show, you can find out all of the details over the website, which is talkingjoe.co.uk. Now, today we are continuing our look at the Brandon Jerwa era of G.I. Joe Disavowed. This time we are looking at his last contribution to that era with Snake Eyes Declassified, issue one from Devil's Due back in September 2005. It came out just a couple of months after Brandon Jerwa's final issue on the main book, which was issue 43. Now, without further ado, let me introduce my co-host. His real name has been redacted, so we can just call him by his file name. It's Real American Tim. <laughs> hello, listeners, and hello, Mark. <laughs> How are you doing? I bet you are chomping at the bit to be talking about some Snake Eyes declassified action. Yes and no. Um, I this is this is a comic that I respectfully never wanted to read. Some of the Devils Do mini series or relaunches pulled me back in, and this was not one. And when when I signed on to be a co-host of this show, you, you know, I borrowed um, sort of half of all the Devils Do comics from someone and found the rest. So I have this box of all the Devils Do comics uh, nearby, and every week or two, I pull out the next bunch, and it is it is an artistic endeavor to take something so affiliated with one writer and to uh expand on it and place it in order and i have always been concerned that reading this mini series either i would just be disappointed it wouldn't be very good or it would somehow change my my feelings for all of the larry hama snake eyes material i, I don't want to say like ruin it because that's that's sort of overdone you know like michael bay ruined my childhood you know or you know ang lee's hulk ruined <laughs> hulk like no 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 there's still lots of great hulk comics and and also potentially start getting things like slightly conflated and muddled up what was from yes from where uh because actually we i saw that a little bit in the more recent uh, Larry Hammer issue where we saw the the flashback uh, the the Storm Shadow solo issue where it was again it was a flashback to the time of the LLRP team in uh, via Vietnam and um, and people were sort of looking at the the sort of the chronology and seeing if it was consistent with like the canon and they were referring back to actually timing of events in the Snake Eyes declassified story which didn't quite fit but of course. Snake Eyes Declassified was never, you know, written by Larry Hammer. So when you say uh, people, are you referring to a few uh, people I'm, online or our Facebook yeah, I was, group? Yeah, a, cu a couple of uh, comments on the uh, His Tank message board uh, specifically, I am thinking of. Uh, and yeah, and so, so when, yeah, when, when you're sort of reading these stories and, and having sort of potentially several years gaps in between reading the different comics, it can be a little bit uh, difficult to remember sometimes, you know, where a particular piece of the story uh, bel belongs to. Uh, yes, uh, that's uh, that's GI Joe two hundred and eighty six that you're referring to the the flashback to uh, Snake Eyes and Company in Vietnam. Okay, so as of this episode, I've only read the first issue because we are only talking mm. about the first issue. We decided, dear listeners, that there might be so much context to get into. We we thought maybe of doing the whole miniseries as one episode or doing the first three issues and the second three issues. And then Mark had the idea, there's just so much to talk about. We'll just do the first issue. And um, if you haven't listened to our episode on Silent Prelude, which is the five-page story that was included 
in the collection, the Devil's Due collection of the Snake Eyes miniseries, Declassified, that story has only ever appeared in print, that five-page story, in the Snake Eyes Declassified uh, collection. May I suggest you also listen to that episode, because that, that goes sort of hand-in-hand hand with this, uh, sort of the new material relating to this favorite character and, and favorite stories. Um, I can start with something uh, positive um, about the Snake Eyes Declassified miniseries, Mark, since we often try to start with something positive. But is there any other um, setup or framework you want to do first? If we do the standard running order, I think next up we would have... Credits and plot breakdown. So creative team for this issue were story Brandon Jawa. Brandon, Brandon Brandon Jawa. Pencils, Emiliano Santa Lucia. And that's pencil, pencils only. Well, I'm sure Tim will refer back to that. Colours, John Rausch. Letters, Steve Seeley. I think that's Tim Seeley's brother. Editor, Marshall Dillon with Mark Powers. And cover, Emiliano Santa Lucia and Jeremy Roberts. Where do you have the editor credits? I'm I'm holding the comic in front of me, and the inside front cover goes from letterer letterer credit to cover credit, and then there's a masthead on the bottom of the page, where Marshall Dillon is listed as associate publisher, Mark Powers is editor in chief, Mike O'Sullivan is associate editor. That I did I cribbed that from Yo Jo, and on on this one I know that uh, the credits were slightly updated when they got to do the trade paperback because hmm. they uh, left off some people. So possibly, uh, possibly it could have something to do with that because I think um, that Andrew Swenson served as a military consultant on this one, but went uncredited on the uh, single issues. Let's have a look at the covers in the gallery. <laughs> There is just one cover, and it is um, black and white and red, and it is an arm. It is a muscular male arm. Uh, we see the the forearm, the top side of the wrist, with the signature Arashikage tattoo. That's in red. The logo is in red. Uh, everything else is black and white. Really, it's black and white and gray. Uh, this is a, a digital painting. This is not colored in the standard, you know, flat colors of old comics from the 50s and 80s. This isn't the uh, sort of standard, you know, 90s, 2000s computer coloring with lots of gradients underneath black outlines. This is this is that digital painting that Marvel popularized with its flare trading cards and that uh, Richard Eisenhove popularized with his painted covers on top of Andy Kubert artwork for the Wolverine Origin miniseries. The, um, oh, I got that wrong. I'm sorry. Andy Kubert penciled the series. Joe Casada penciled the covers, which Richard Eisenhove digitally painted. Uh, and this arm is in the rain. And this is a really striking cover. I oftentimes sort of like but don't love the best digitally painted covers in this style, because I see a softness in them. I see a, a, a little bit of a, a fuzziness to them, sometimes where one object ends and another begins, sort of the edges, where with normal traditional artwork, you'd have a black line. And I'm not a painter. And when I have occasionally played around with paint or marker, because I'm drawing someone a birthday card or something, I, I often think, wow, my sense of rendering here uh, is okay. I, I, this will be much clearer when I go in with a black pen on top of this and, you know, really define this person from this background or this, this arm from this torso. And I'm seeing a tiny bit of that softness here, uh, which I, I don't like. But in terms of technical skill, this is quite good. In terms of um, something that's different for G.I. Joe, instantly recognizable, as G.I. Joe and striking, right? Jumps out on a rack filled with comics. And there aren't a lot of characters, you know, that you could do this with, you know, Wolverine's arm, like uh, the cover, John Cassidy's cover to Astonishing X-Men number one, right? 
It's like, you immediately know who that is, you know? But like Superman's arm, yes, you can guess if you can narrow it down, but you know, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a blue sleeve. And, uh, and, and this is a clenched fist, right? So, you know, there's, there's some tension here. Um, so this is a, uh, this is a striking and well-designed cover. And interestingly, notably, um, there is a G.I. Joe logo on the bottom left in the sort of corner box. Yeah. But the, you know, the title of the comic, both on the cover and also in the indicia is Snake Eyes Declassified. It's not G.I. Joe Snake Eyes Declassified. As you say, it's really striking uh, cover. And, and I do like actually the all of the covers to this series some are better than others but they it sort of has a, a sort of th- through line of, of having this black and white and gray plus red highlights through the uh six covers so so it's it's i think always good when when there's when, when it isn't just like a random image that could be sort of plucked from anywhere almost it is that there is that kind of connective tissue where where they are you know they, they they are of a piece, but also of a set, uh, and I think I think that is a uh, is a strong uh, use of covers for this uh, series. But we'll we'll touch on that a bit more. As a as a slight uh, corollary, the hardcover and the softcover collection of this mini series uses the cover from issue number one, and does include a smaller GI Joe logo at the very top. So technically, the collections are called GI Joe Snake Eyes Declassified. And actually, while we're talking about the front cover, let's let's also mention the the back cover because what's interesting for these uh, these six issues, or at least at least <laughs> uh, five of them, is that they have a a next issue teaser on the very back cover where they have a zoomed in component of the uh, the following issues uh, cover. So on on the back cover of this one, it's got a photo of Snake Eyes's sister Terry. Um, with a sort of bullet hole uh, through it, and that's the that's the sort of detail that is zoomed in for this sort of trailer, and then the actual cover it's, itself uh, is sort of zoomed out, and it you know, features uh, a gravestone and and so on. So yeah, very good um, design, I thought, on on these back covers. To, to um, this this really belongs to our our next episode, but uh, I just want to point out because I'm sure I'll forget when we talk about the rest of this mini series. Issue number two gets a second printing with the same cover as its first printing. That's the only issue in this miniseries that gets the second printing. Oh, huh, interesting. And that is and that's and there are no variant covers, that which is the point I'm trying to make. Shall I do plot breakdown? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it feels like this plot, plot breakdown is almost somewhat res- redundant, but but let's do it anyway. So here we go. Snake Eyes ships out to war in Southeast Asia after having a last dinner with his family. Snake Eyes is then part of a long-range recon patrol that includes Tommy Arishikagi, Lorenzo Wilkinson and Wade Collins. The team is suspicious of Snake Eyes. The patrol accidentally walks into a camp of the enemy where most of the team is killed, leaving Snake Eyes injured. Tommy makes a dramatic rescue of Snake Eyes. After some recovery from his injuries, Snake Eyes is sent home. As he waits at the airport, Colonel Clay Abernathy arrives to inform him that his family has been killed in a car accident. So that's what the issue covers in terms of plot as a, in a nutshell. But um, Tim, what did you think of it? You said you were going to say something nice. Oh, that the covers. Oh, the covers. Okay, we had the nice bit. <laughs> okay. um, is, is it worth pointing out here that pages 1 through 13 are new material Pages 14 and 15, which is a two-page splash of all six members of the LERP team, uh, is an expansion of the splash page of G.I. Joe issue 155, which is penciled by Phil Gozier, the final Marvel issue of G.I. Joe, right? A letter from Snake Eyes. And then the next few pages, what's that? What uh, I think that makes uh, 16... 17 is sort of an extrapolation um a little bit of then 18 and 21 and are sort of redrawn from marvel issue 
26, I think, mm-hmm. yep. if I'm if I'm remembering correctly. So the so the point I want to make here is that you know we haven't we haven't spelled it out. I, we've 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 yeah us, we've described it indirectly twice. So spell it out for us what's happening here, Mark. So I think I think the sort of the core um, and it, it's interesting you point actually that 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 out, Tim. I hadn't quite sort of seen it quite so stark that essentially the first half of the book is a new made up backstory, and then the second half is is a retelling of existing uh, plot points that from from earlier issues but essentially i guess the mission statement of this book really in, in my interpretation is is let's have a mini series that tells the origins of snake eyes that brings him up essentially to uh, the point at which uh, you know he's he's introduced into the gi joe team in in issue 1 and essentially across the original series issue 1 through to 155 we saw in little snapshots elements of the snake eyes's backstory sort of unveiled as as kind of somewhat of uh, a mystery and that was like the main you know main sort of through line of of the original gi joe um series that that sort of kicked off really with um issue 26 and and that mystery was yet yeah, a key part of that original marvel run and, and what this is really doing this this mini series is piecing together those little nuggets that were sort of spread out the the original Marvel run and trying to use that to join them to, be, to together for the first time and and give us a single cohesive Snake Eyes story all all, all in one go rather than you know seeking out those few pages here a few pages there from from across these various issues and and essentially there there's a handful of key issues from that marvel run which i was just gonna outline which sort of give the give the foundation for this this series so we've got uh issue 26 to 27 which is snake eyes the origin we've then got 43 crossroads which is where wade collins gives his flashback uh to the to the lerp um scenes and, and expands those then there's 59 through to 62 which is where we were introduced to Jinx and the Blind Master, and they sort of expand out a bit of the the story of the Arashikage clan. Uh, and then we have a key issue, eighty four, which is essentially the Zartan side of of that uh, story, uh, where Zartan takes up with Onihashi, the swordsmith. Uh, we then have uh, ninety four through to ninety six, which is the Snake Eyes trilogy. And it's it's not so key to this story, but uh, it is touched on in this issue, which is uh, where uh, Snake Eyes is out again in Vietnam and encounters a very young Baroness. Then there is issue 120, 126, which is Firefly giving his side of the story, where it's revealed that he is the faceless master. There is 144 which is uh, an expanded version of the uh, accidents where the helicopter crashes, uh, causing Snake Eyes' horrific injuries. Uh, and then uh, final, finally, and, and um, there's 155, which is Snake Eyes writing to uh, Sean Collins, and um, that expands, again, the, the, uh, the LERP uh, flashback sequences. And there's, there's, I'm sure there's, there's sort of other bits here and there that, that, um, that also um, touch on these various elements of, of backstory. So uh, a lot of material sort of spread out every few issues uh, over the course of a very long uh, original run, and uh, and certainly it was a key part of uh, the original run, building up that that story, but. Unless you had read all of them and collected all of them, there is uh, this, it's entirely possible that there will, will be elements that uh, that you've never encountered before. I mentioned Origin, the Wolverine miniseries, which is I think two thousand one, two thousand two, and Origin. It was originally published and it was just called Origin. Right now, when you buy the book, it's Wolverine Origin or Wolverine the Origin. That was all new story. And that was colored straight from the pencils. And all six covers were in this golden yellow, orange, 
uh, light and the covers were all di fully digitally painted on top of pencil art. And you could give that to someone who either had never read X-Men or Wolverine comics and say, this is a really interesting story, or you could give it to someone who's always, who has read though some and has always wanted to know, no, what is Wolverine's origin? Give me something before what we've known. And this operates in some ways similarly. It also six issues, also has a tantalizing and yet vague uh, title, Declassified, right? And I, I kind of feel like a, a different version of Devil's Due would have just called this Declassified. They wouldn't have even called it Snake Eyes Declassified or G.I. Joe Declassified, the way that it's it's quite a bold move on Marvel's point, although also sort of annoying that I guess Wolverine is the most important Marvel character <laughs> such that you can call a, a Marvel story origin and it's not about the universe or galactus or spider-man <laughs> or fantastic four or the early x-men no it's about the guy from 1975 with claws who you know is the best anyway best at what he does so uh similarly this, this miniseries has six covers they're all digitally painted it's all in a striking color scheme the interiors are all computer color on top of pencils only and you could give this to someone who um doesn't know gi joe and snake eyes and it's hopefully a really compelling, you know, overview, um, overview is not right, a, a focused chronology of Snake Eyes' origin. Uh, you could also give this to an established Joe fan who, you know, they've moved in their comics or, you know, in another place where they grew up or they don't have all the G.I. Joe issues. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Put it all together in order for me. And sort of my counter at the time, I had two counters at the time. One would be, no, if you want to do this, do a book that collects 26, 27, 43, uh, you know, 84, 144, 155. That's that's choppy because there are also all those, you know, subplots where someone shows up for three pages and then their story continues in another issue. And also, even though Snake Eyes is the most popular Joe and sort of my favorite character, I do think that doing too much of the spotlight on one character in G.I. Joe slightly misses the point that G.I. Joe is a team. It's an ensemble. And, you know, as important as Snake Eyes' origin is, as it runs through the G.I. Mm -hmm. Joe series, you know, I mean, Cobra Commander's origin is as important. You know, used car salesman, you know, direct domestic terrorist. And all the characters who don't get exciting origins because they just joined the military. Devil's Due is totally within its right to make a Snake Eyes miniseries to expand on uh, Snake Eyes' origin. But here's my other counter. Shouldn't this be Larry Hama writing this? Th here's where another comparison I find is valuable. Uh, and I've done this one before. There are only a couple comics out there where one person has written a comic for a really long time. Dave Sim writing Cerebus. Uh, Sergio Aragonis and Mark Evanier on Gru, Chris Claremont on on Canny X Men, you know maybe maybe Bendis if you Brian Michael Bendis if you count uh, Avengers and New Avengers and M Mighty Avengers and whatever Avengers turned into turned into Avengers after it was New Avengers, um, and I can see the argument when Blaylock starts GI Joe that he, A, wants to do his G.I. Joe in 2001, and B, probably, we don't have confirmation on this, but it is it is a safe assumption based on our interviews. Uh, the company did not have the money to hire Larry Hama to write G.I. Joe comics in 2001, but soon enough they did. So it's not like Hama's not around in 2005 when it's time to publish Snake Eyes Declassified. and. I have to think that had Devil's Due reached out to him, because they'd already hired him two or three times, and said, do you want to do a Snake Eyes miniseries where you sort of tell the whole story again and add to it? I feel like Hama, who tends to say yes to jobs because he's been a freelancer for decades, would have said yes. And, you know, after Chris, Chris I mean, no one else is going to do Gru, so... That comparison doesn't work. Uh, uh, Stan Sakai on Usagi Ojimbo, right? No one else is going to do Usagi Ojimbo, so that comparison doesn't work. 
So I had a slight counterpoint to to that, which is that um, Larry Hammer had written the Frontline Arc, the mission that never was, and did not enjoy that experience at all because it was you know relatively heavily edited. He had to sort of stay out at the front. Um, what was going to happen in across across the art in, in, in each issue ahead of writing it, and he did not enjoy the experience. And they were able to get him back eventually, but uh, only with the promise that um, he could do what he wanted essentially. And what they were trying to do here was basically replay a story that already existed. So it was a somewhat there, there's a bit of sort of editing of of saying these are the bits from the snake eyes's history and that we want to relay and and then there's some room around the sides to to create some some new story as as well but i i i i'm not sure that larry hammer would have either wanted to have done that um of of essentially being told to replay these key story beats from pre- previous stories particularly with that that previous experience that he didn't in, enjoy or if he did we i think well we would certainly have ended up with a very different story that is a good counter Giorgio frontlines 2002 snake eyes declassified is 2005 a lot can mm. happen in 3 years hama had already retold some of his gi joe story and you even said it cuz issue 144 is an expansion of the flashback to the helicopter crash. So yes, I do think it is a reasonable, I think there's a a good chance that Hama would have said, no, thank you. Poten- potentially it might have even gone, we can, we can ask, we can ask, I hope, you know, maybe we can ask them when we speak to them uh, next, but it could have even gone. Do you want to do this snake eyes project, which is essentially creating a best of the existing Snake Eyes' stories. No thanks, but I'd really love to do something set in the past of the G.I. Joe team. What about G.I. Joe classif- Declassified? Because let's not forget that um, Snake Eyes Declassified was the, the first in a series of four of the Declassified brand, because uh, we have uh, Scarlet Declassified, G.I. Joe Declassified, and also Dreadnoughts Declassified. Uh, right. And, you know, maybe Hama said, uh, no, thanks. I'd rather tell new stories. Uh, and maybe that's how Storm Shadow came about, which is, I think, a year and a half later. Okay, so now we can get into Devil's Due is certainly allowed to do this, right? Legally, they had the license. They're allowed to do this. They're under no artistic or moral or business obligation to offer this to Larry Hama. Just because you can do something. (laughs) <laughs> doesn't mean you should some dudes you should do something and um sorry i want to I just uh, pick up the thread with uh where i said chris claremont on on uncanny x-men um claremont uh I, I i forget if he if he left or if he was fired or if he left because he was so not having fun and unwelcome that it's kind of like he was fired and he left and it's all the same thing i don't remember but this happens after this happens in 1991, three issues into the new, you know, Jim Lee X Men, adjectiveless X Men series. And um, Claremont's voice and the, the sales of Uncanny X Men through the 80s, he was such a big, you know, great artist, but he was such an important part of that. And after he's gone, there are other writers who are writing in a Chris Claremont style. And I really picked up on that at the time, and it took me a while to realize I didn't like it. So that's that's sort of the end of the you know other comics that are kind of like this uh, comparison because you know Marvel wasn't going to after that particular editorial like regime made Claremont unwelcome. They weren't going to immediately have him back because you know one kid out there thought that that was artistically mean. But I, I do think of sort of these comparisons as interesting and helpful because there's nothing that's a perfect comparison but you know other comics other publishers other creatives how did how did other people and teams and outfits handle this kind of thing where uh you know like the wolverine origin that does get told in the uh bill jemis casada 
Paul Jenkins' Andy Kubert origin miniseries is not at all what Claremont was going to do, what John Byrne was going to do had he stuck around. Um, and actually, those two guys did get to tell their own stories later on in you know various sort of quote what if uh, specials. All right, so uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And my, my my main concern besides what I said at the top of the show that reading this would somehow sort of quote ruin the original for me because that that doesn't actually really happen right I can, I can read this I can say well I don't love that I wish I hadn't read it I'll just go reread the original the original is so awesome and I'll feel good again right but my sort of other artistic concern is that if you put a Brandon Jerwa and an Emiliano Santa Lucia up against several great issues written by Hama and one of them drawn by him, the comparison is unflattering. Mm. If you put the sort of median level of talent at Marvel in the 80s and 90s, and I know I'm looking through this uh, at this through a lens of nostalgia because I like I like the Marvel house style of the 80s. I know Jim Shooter says there's no house style of the 80s, but I do think half of Marvel in the 80s is a house style and I like it. Paper, printing, color, you know, you get sort of any average inker at Marvel in the 80s and they're they're just a better artist than most of the inkers that Devil's Do was hiring around 2004. And hey, here's a miniseries that doesn't have an inker. And so the comparison is unflattering that if Brandon Jerwa wants to make his mark as a writer or on G.I. Joe, he should tell the best stories he can, not retread someone else's best stories. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe maybe I'll ask him, um, Brandon Jerwa, were you worried that, you know, like your reputation would be diminished <laughs> for trying to be like a Larry Hama uh, sort of adjunct in 2005? Maybe if we interview him again, maybe, maybe I'll ask him. So, okay. So that, that's sort of my like overall take. Like, this is a really interesting idea. Oh, don't do that. But hey, now I'm doing a podcast all these years later. So I definitely will read this and I'd like to talk about it. Um, so I open it up and I, so here's, um, when is G.I. Joe, re, uh, when is all right, G.I. Joe Reborn? Reloaded. Right. Uh, okay, G.I. Joe Reloaded starts with two prologue specials, G.I. Joe Reborn and G.I. Joe Cobra Reborn. And the cover, this is 2004, right? right. This is before Snake Eyes Declassified. The cover to G.I. Joe Reborn is by Timothy Bradstreet, and it's a really cool drawing of Snake Eyes in a sort of underground brick uh, tunnel with stairs behind him. And interestingly... Uh, an art director or someone at Devil's Do for the inside front cover of Snake Eyes Declassified has cut out just the figure of Snake Eyes from this cover of a different G.I. Joe comic that's a different continuity from the year earlier and stuck it here on the inside front cover. Now, I think most people see this and they just see a cool drawing of Snake Eyes and they're okay with that or they're thrilled by it. I look at this and I see brand confusion right like if i open up an issue of let's say it's 2005 if i open up an issue of amazing spider-man or uncanny x-men and i see an a drawing of spider-man or wolverine from ultimate x-men or ultimate spider-man on the inside front cover i will get confused because that's a different spider-man this is a different wolverine this, so so there's a small thing that i immediately think Huh. Okay. That's, that's confusing. This is like pulling me out of it. Okay. And then I'm immediately aware that this is colored from the pencils. It's not inked. And this may be a stylistic choice, right? It, it was for Marvel's origin, but it may also be a budgetary concern because hiring an inker is another, whatever it is, hundred bucks a page, 80 bucks a page, 150 bucks a page. And it's also time and devils do in 2005. I don't know quite what their financial fortunes are, but you know, if you could produce a GI Joe miniseries for uh, what's, what's a hundred times 22 times five, you know, a couple thousand dollars less that might affect your bottom line. 
there are some artists who can definitely pull off pencils only because they're putting that much more into it. And uh, I have enjoyed some of Emiliano Santelicia's previous work on G.I. Joe. I don't think his pencils only approach works here for two reasons. One, I don't think for three reasons. One, I don't think the actual drawing is strong enough. Two, I don't think the color artist, John Rauch, is in terms of color agreeing with the pencils. Okay, here's the comparison. In 2001, Marvel publishes an X-Men comic called Extreme X-Men. And Chris Claremont is back. And Salvador La Roca draws the book. Draws the first, I forget, 20 or 30 issues. And uh, Liquid, which is a color studio, Liquid colors that book straight from the pencils. And, And it doesn't work. A, Liquid's colors are super rendered and saturated. But more importantly, they don't darken LaRocca's pencils. So if you pick up any of those first, say, 20 issues of Extreme X-Men, all of the black outlines, all the places where, like, Bishop's hair has been sort of colored in, quote, black with pencil, it all shows up as light or medium gray. And so the color overwhelms it, and the art falls apart. It's hard to tell what you're looking at because you have this this relative ratio of brightness to darkness that doesn't work. There's no balance, right? If you're in Photoshop terms, if you open up your histogram, if you go to levels, right, there's nothing that's pure black, right? Your value structure is from like one to six, not one to 10 on a scale of 10. And as a comparison, just uh, two years later, two years later, Salvador La Roca at Marvel draws a book featuring Namor, the underwater guy, and it is inked, and it's colored, uh, not by liquid, by someone who colors in that style. And it totally works, because every outline, every line is black, like it should be. Okay, so Snake Eyes Declassified. First page doesn't really jump out, but page two feels totally out of balance, because the things that are bright, like the sun behind the house in panel one and the highlights on everyone's hair in panel two are out of balance with how there's nothing that's pure black on a scale of one to 10, one being pure white and 10 being pure black. This page goes from, I don't know, one to eight or nine. And it looks, I don't have a good word for it, icky. It sort of ends up being muddy because there's all this color sitting underneath all of these sort of pencil fills like the like the trees in panel one or the roof in panel one or the back of the dad in panel two and then strangely page two the pencils don't go dark enough pages page three the pencils do and this is absolutely like up to the color artist and like uh adjusting some levels on those pencil scans before applying color Um, And then it happens throughout the comic where like one or two more pages have this proper balance of black where the pencils have been darkened, but most of them don't. And so a lot of the art in this is simultaneously muddy and too bright, like the highlights are too bright and also out of balance. And so I find reading this comic from a visual perspective unpleasant And then there are some scenes that are directly redraws of Larry Hama panels and pages from issue 26. And again, the comparison is not flattering. Yeah, I mean, as a a counterbalance here, um, I think generally that that sort of technique here doesn't bother me too much. Um, I think that's because Emiliano Santalucia here and Robert Aitkins in subsequent books draw quite tightly um it's quite close to you know the tightness the crispness of a an inked line even if it requires the colorist to to make sure that they darken it um sufficiently in a couple of places it sort of sticks out a little bit more like on the second page of the llrp um team where wade is walking away uh walking over to the rest of the team and and they're uh, initially in in shadow in silhouette and it's a sort of a scrappy 
shaded in pencil line rather than a solid you know, inked black line um, there. I think you're talking about page page seven, panel two, where he says we're clear. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but just 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 one quick comparison. Uh, look at the first page of Marvel issue one fifty five, the splash page of the Lerp group walking toward us, and Santa Lucia's uh, redraw of it, which is the double page splash in the middle of Declassified One. Page one of issue one fifty five has a weight to it because of that black ink, and it's it's good drawing in Declassified, the two page spread. Um, I think but- it's drawn better. Well, in better in inverted commas. Um, than than one five five because that style of of one five five is is sort of very much the artist's own slightly more exaggerated style and and as you're saying if you're to kind of just you know reprint it stitching the original pencils together what what this this technique here benefits from is that it's all more of a piece all in the same style whereas um, it's a little bit more jarring if you're going from issue 26, say, to 155, because they are they look so visually different. Right. Um, you could also make the artistic argument that uh, the pencil art here is less about budget or time and more about memory. That if the artwork is drawn tightly in pencil but not inked, if the pencil artwork is not darkened all the way to pure black, it you know, like in movies, black and white movie, uh, a black and white sequence or a sepia sequence is sometimes a symbol of a flashback. And this whole miniseries is kind of a memory. So there's an argument to be made for it. Interesting. Shall we maybe have a like a bit of a sort of a flick through and, and sort of see what thoughts it triggers at, at the moment? The, yeah, yeah. the the page one, we've got the chup 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 of a sprinkler being compared to the the blades of a Huey helicopter there. Brandon Jera here's, uh, you know, writing this and, and obviously is going, trying to go for a sort of a cinematic technique here of a kind of a fade from, from one to the other, which. In fact, uh, this is a reference, whether on purpose or not, to a famous film about Vietnam. Okay. Trivia question, listeners and Mark, what film has is the first has the first credit for sound designer which film has the first credit for a sound designer yes Drums. sound sound designer not not sound recordist not dialogue sound designer uh, i will tell you it is apocalypse now that's what i was about to say damn it <laughs> right, so, ni- so 1979 so the film is directed by francis ford coppola and Walter Murch is the credited sound designer. And sound design in the film is great, right? Like this is a category in the Academy Awards, right? We give awards uh, for sound design. Okay, so this first, so at the beginning of Apocalypse Now, you hear a helicopter. The first thing that happens in that movie before you see anything, the first thing that happens in that movie is you hear a very strange otherworldly rotor blade right and then you see part of a helicopter and then you see some of the forest the jungle uh and then you see flame and uh then there's a song and then we are then there's this amazing sequence where we are both looking at a ceiling fan and also uh the actor martin sheen who's lying in a bed looking up at the ceiling fan and there are some double exposures and crossfades so you go from his eye to the ceiling fan uh, and you are supposed to be thinking of a helicopter rotor blade and you are hearing a uh, artistically exaggerated helicopter rotor blade and then also a real helicopter rotor blade out of the window right it's an amazing sequence right great film right um, I, I use this as, as, as an example in my sound design lecture in my character animation class uh, when we spend a day on sound, right? Diegetic sound, non-diegetic sound. And uh, so to go from helicopter rotor blade to sprinkler is doing something very similar that Apocalypse Now does to go from helicopter rotor blade to ceiling fan. And this comic does it twice. And I open the first page and I think, Oh, cool. Jura was making a reference to Apocalypse Now. How powerful. And then I also think, well, this is four panels of not a lot of story happening. 
and I'm that much more aware again that this is not Hama who's writing this because he would never take four panels on a sprinkler. And also, I'm aware that this is a decompressed comic book from 2005, not a sort of normal or compressed comic book from, say, the 70s or 80s. Uh, so artistically, I'm intrigued by the first page, but it brings up another comparison that it's like, no, I just I just want this to be Hama or I just want this to be some other Snake Eyes miniseries. Then we're into a sort of domestic scene at Snake Eyes' family home as they're having their farewell dinner before he ships out to Nam. Snake Eyes is quite chatty here. So I guess this is, at this point in time, the pretty much the first time that Snake Eyes has spoken in terms of this chronology. And the art of this uh, sort of domestic scene is not perhaps the strongest that dinner table looking quite sort of cluttered the uh, body language a little bit unnatural i'm going to pick on john roush here this is a candlelit dinner and yet there are all sorts of highlights all over these characters that don't obey that light source you set up an interesting contrast by having snake eyes talk at the beginning of the story because later he's not going to be able to talk mm. but as I said before on the show, I think as an artistic decision, even though Snake Eyes, before G.I. Joe and before his accident, can talk, I think there is a really clever sort of rhyme or consistency in having him not talk. He hasn't taken a vow of silence before he gets to Vietnam. He hasn't been injured. But to reflect the Snake Eyes that we know later and to sort of say that um i i don't want snake eyes to talk basically when when he does talk it should it should sort of mean everything in the world and as you say he's pretty chatty here <laughs> and we get the origin of his uh of his code name <sighs> his father do, the, do you... the line do the line luck runs out quick though you step up to gamble one more time and the next thing you know snake eye End of the line. Yeah, so that's after a panel where Snake Eyes' dad is talking about luck. And maybe, maybe my my grumble sigh is too strong here. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, uh, lots of Joes, you know, like, where does Cover Girl get her code name? Well, she was a model before she joined the armed forces. And she might have been a cover girl. Or she might have wanted to be a cover girl. I don't, I don't need a clever or cute um, reference to where their code name came from or how they got their code names. And this isn't too on the nose, but it's pretty close. And, you know, some things can just be a mystery. And, you know, it's like um, a comic book that tells the Joker's origin. And I know there have been one or two and a movie, sort of, but you also get the idea that sort of none of those are true. When someone tells that story, it's a lie to sort of throw you off because the Joker is crazy, right? Or it, it's it's sort of a what if story. I'm happy for the Joker, you know, to not have his origin. And I'm happy to not know where Snake Eyes comes from. Because in the back of my mind, I know that it's just a cool thing that someone at Hasbro came up with or Larry Hama came up with and it cleared legal and you know, the sort of meaning gets added to it later, but I, I, I don't need it spelled out here. I mean, I guess I'm glad that it's not even more on the nose. There isn't some scene where like Snake Eyes takes a weekend in Saigon, you know, like he gets the weekend off and he's like, I'm going to go gamble. Let me roll this <laughs> dice. Oh no, I got a one and a one. Well, I guess that means that we'll be calling you. Yeah. Um, uh, here's, here's, sorry, here's another point I want to make about, about this miniseries, about things in the miniseries being so on the nose. The photo of Snake Eyes' sister, which is such a important but occasional part of the original Marvel run, you know, it comes up two or three times. I know it makes the cover of 26. Wait, his sister is holding it the moment that they're saying goodbye? Like, wait, 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 wait. We're three pages into this miniseries and, like, here's the photo? Like, she gives it to him 
the moment he leaves, I, I think that's maybe when you give someone that photo, but <sighs> it's pretty on the nose. I, I had a grumble about the photo, Tim. Can you tell what it is? Uh, it's too big. It's too big. She's like holding it with two hands. It's like the, the size of two of her fists, bigger perhaps. And this is meant to be a photo that's small enough that he can tuck into the band of his hat. Yeah. You're looking like some crazy mad hatter guy. Otherwise, it's... <laughs> what is, so she's actually holding a, a, a giant card that says 10 slash six, and it's going to... Uh, nah. um, uh, similarly, if I don't want Snake Eyes to talk, I don't think I want his sister to talk. Now, I'm not trying to rob a character of agency. I'm not trying to rob a female character of agency. I don't want Snake Eyes' sister to just be a symbol or a victim, right? She's just in a car accident and we never get to know her. But uh, yes, I'm having a hard time with this scene with sort of seeing his parents and seeing them all talk and having this final dinner. Please please continue. Let's go. So then we, we chop, 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 chop to uh southeast asia uh where snake eyes is sort of getting down for a kip on the ground in the jungle talking to what's a kip a kip it's a a nap that's a british nap (laughs) it's a british nap yeah okay (laughs) so he's he's lying down sort of apparently going to sleep and then uh wade sort of goes off to the rest of the team um which given that he's meant to be on guard duty is not a good sign but let's leave that um, so he's called a meeting to talk about, yeah, not not liking the, the smell of old snake eyes for some reason that isn't particularly well explained. You mean literally the smell of him? <laughs> no, I mean they're no. suspicious. Okay, they're... Suspicious. Okay, okay. Uh, there was one bit of this that that I like that sort of rings true, which feels very Hammer, which is that when um, Storm Shadow speaks up for him, does it very succinct, succinctly, and just says. We're pretty tight in that unit. He's a stand-up guy in the field. And I think, you know, a hammerism would be if you say someone's a stand-up guy, that's probably enough. Um, you know, as hard as I am on the art here, the the anatomy and the backgrounds are great. And as hard as I have been on um, then concurrent and previous issues of the regular Devils Do, G.I. Joe, I'd love an inker, but you know, man, if if uh, Santa Lucia had been drawing the Devil's Due book from the beginning, it would be a very different story for me. You know, these these two pages where we're fully into the flashback, or we're fully into the scene now that Snake Eyes is shipped off. Right, the first panel, there's a helicopter uh, taking off, and then you know, the the group is talking. You know, except for the color and sort of the lack of inking. The pencils are full. This is fully penciled. You know, this this looks like this could have been right around issue 150 of the Marvel GI Joe. Um, so uh, on the on the best pages, I do like the pencils by themselves as a as a discrete unit. I do like seeing the other three guys in this group. That is the one thing that I'm most interested in in this issue, in this miniseries, that they don't make it out of this story and Hama only checks in with them once or twice and briefly. And, you know, when we meet them again in IDW's issue 286, that was that was exciting for me. And so since Hama hadn't done much with that, and we know Snake Eyes and Storm Shadow and, and Stalker, I'm sort of happy to see this group get a dynamic even if you're right it's it's i'm not fully sold on them being spooked out by snake eyes i think i think that wants another explanation more explanation or or a scene where he does something that's sort of too intense even for these guys in vietnam in a special group yeah it doesn't seem like we there's enough of a trigger for them to be so suspicious of them there's um stalker refers back to uh, the incident at one of Uncle Sugar's spook houses, which is the 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 one that is in the Snake Eyes trilogy in the, in the nineties, and um, this and the, and the chronology works here, but in the subsequent IDW issue, was it two eighty six? Yeah, 
the the dynamic is different in in terms of Storm Shadow joins the established team, whereas here it's uh, sort of Snake Eyes coming uh, coming in a little bit later to this group and then being more uncertain of him as the new person entering the. the Talk about the next bit. So so we've got then got a little this little submission where the Lerp team take on this outpost uh, sort of explodes what looks initially like it might be some sort of ammo dump or, or something uh, and then snake eyes realizes that uh, that actually the these vietnamese have got hold of some us medicine um rather than uh, anything um any sort of ammunition or anything t- too suspicious and and he sort of wants to to back down to you know to actually the, the, the medicine is for for the families for the kids so, so he doesn't want to have any involvement in that i thought this was good a scene like this makes me think of marvel's the nom monthly series about vietnam that started in 1987 larry hama was the editor at the beginning and even though the nom was approved by the comics code and so it was a pg pg13 version of war right and there were lots of scenes that were toned down and lots of uh portrayals and events and dialogue that couldn't be in the book because it was not a mature reader's book um but it was really important to writer doug murray that the series was code approved that it could get out to the widest audience possible because he was a vet and there were many vets in the 80s in america who didn't talk about their experience with their friends or family. And this series was a way for some of those family members or friends to learn about what had happened and maybe to bridge uh, the divide. And so even though that book is uh, a little toned down, when there's a scene like this where someone may be doing something awful, someone feels betrayed by their intelligence, by their government, by their commanding officer, there's a surprise. I feel like the Nam did this kind of scene a few times and a little stronger. And so this this is good. But again, I'm sort of even even like the best moments of this comic, I'm having a lot of dissonance with just being able to sink in and read it and enjoy a different version of G.I. Joe and a different version of Snake Eyes from a different writer. The next uh, scene, we've got a bit of a heart to heart between Tommy and Snake Eyes, and Snake Eyes is sort of like pointing towards he's being distant from his teammates because Tommy and Snake Eyes were previously uh, part of a squad that was wiped out, leaving just the two of them. Which uh, it's it's not sort of called out specifically in one five five, but there's a there's a scene where Snake Eyes. Is talking about that there's no honor or glory in the pri- primary occupation of the soldier and and he says ask anyone who has sat benumbed in the aftermath of a battle surrounded by stinking ragged wet bodies of comrades hastily covered with poncho assailed by the unearthly screaming of the maimed and and this is where uh, it's snake eyes in in that lerp uniform with the m60 is trademark hat surrounded by bodies of fallen comrades and and possibly possibly that might have been the point of inspiration that was taken for this scene recalling the uh, uh, the death of their previous squad so this this scene which starts on page 12 in panel 3 snake eyes has three word balloons of dialogue Right. And so he says, I chose this way of life for one simple reason. I just want the people I care about to be safe. I'm not naive enough to think I can magically prevent something from happening to my family. I know I can't directly control that, but I guess I'm hoping that if there is a God up there running the show, well, maybe he understands the idea of fair trade, you know? And I, on the one hand, I thought, oh, we're really getting to his head and he's connecting back to uh, his family, the opening scene, because here he mentions God and back on page three, his father talks about faith, right? But pretty, pretty vaguely, right? This, this, if you are not religious or if you don't want religion in GI Joe, it's, it's very lightly referred to here. Back on mm-hmm. page three, right? His dad says he wants to give him fatherly advice. 
And he says, you're going to see things nobody should ever have to see. Keep your faith, son. And he's got his his fingers um, uh, crossed together. But it's not like he has a Christian cross around his neck. It's not like there's a crucifix up on the wall behind him. He's not handing his son a Bible. And so I think that on the one hand, on page 12, Snake Eyes' reference to if there is a God up there is general enough that it doesn't feel like sort of a, a change in the rules of G.I. Joe. But once again, I'm very aware, you know, Hama is never going to write dialogue like that. Hama is not going to refer to a Joe thinking there may or may not be a god up there. And also, this is a lot of dialogue for a character who I don't want to be speaking. And, you know, if you just if you just have two characters, you know, standing and sitting by their bunk beds, having a heart to heart, you're going to have to have some dialogue exchanged. But... These two pages, I'm just aware, pages 13 and 14, uh, just a lot of talking back and forth and not a lot of, I don't mean action like fighting, not a lot of action like physical movement, handling of props, progressing of of story points. It's just like feelings and emotions. And so to me, it, it comes across as a wordy. And the the next page is a double splash of the the team, which, as you've sort of recalled before, is is essentially a reinterpretation of a scene from one five five. And I've got a sort of a partial error detected there, which is that back in issue forty three, uh, Wade is taking point with a Swedish K as his uh, weapon of choice, uh, but uh, here he has got a an M sixteen or equivalent but that is consistent with how he's drawn in 155 so where there's an error that's been made it's it's a repetition of the error in in 155 and, and probably uh, in, intentional there's, there's also an interesting sort of bit of inconsistency around wade turning around and telling off dicky sackstein so uh here he's sort of swigging on his canteen and Wade turns back and says, tighten up the noise, discipline, Sapstein, just as he's walking into that camp of the Vietnamese uh, cooking up their smelly rice. And ba- back in the first uh, first appearance of this scene, Wade uh, says that he turned back because someone had, tri- uh, had, had stepped on a twig. And then in 155, he, he's uh, telling off someone for sloshing their canteen. Um, and here he's got d- different dialogue a- again, although again it's, it's someone swigging on a t- canteen. So different and slightly intentional, evolving canon chronology there. Yeah, and then the the next page is just sad because we see three of Snake Eyes' friends take fire. Two of them get shot, and one of them steps on a landmine, and whether I love the comic or not, it's always it's always sad to see one of these scenes, even if, you know, in flashback, it is so foundational to a character, or to a mythology um, of a comic. And then you turn the page. So now uh, 1718 is where we're getting some uh, redraws of Larry Hama panels from 26. Uh, I know I should read this comic carefully and slowly so that I can be, I can, I'm doing my proper due diligence for the podcast. But when I got to these two pages, right, that final panel on the left, some of these panels on, on the right in the nine panel grid, uh, I just see a Larry Hama layout and I, I did read them, but I wasn't reading them for continuity and to take notes, just sort of like read them like, uh, I've seen this scene. <laughs> Grump, grumpy it's, Tim. It's you say it, it's it's not it's not necessarily the the Larry Hammer layout of the page, but the very close to the layout of the original panel. Uh yes, yes, yeah. Thank you. Good, good, good clarification. Santa Lucia is not uh, redoing whole pages. He's using Hama panels in his own page layout. It's an interesting bit of sort of shortening of the of this sequence because the the sort of that. Ambush or <laughs> unintended ambush it, that's sort of laid out in issue forty three. It sort of follows on from from the you know initiation of that that the first time we see that 
a point of that sequence in 26, which is mostly picking up following the encounter where they'd already lost their uh, their team teammates and there it's it's more extended that they've they've gotten away from the initial firefights sort of they've gone through the the rice paddy um storm shadow has taken out uh, a lone a soldier with his arrow and they're sort of waiting by a tree as as the helicopter comes in and they've they've very much shortened that sequence here so it's sort of the initial encounter immediately leads to to snake eyes um, getting uh, taking fire and, and getting hit, uh, whereas reading the the two separately, it feels like there's quite some time that passes in between those two sequences. Of course, Jerwa can stack time and events how he wants for the purposes of pacing in his own six mm. issue miniseries. It's interesting to me that in a miniseries which is going to take a few scenes and references and build on them and expand them to six issues that Jirwa wouldn't use the sort of longer version uh, mm. from the original. So yeah, now we're, we're in, yeah, the, the sort of famous issue 26 se- sequences of the Tommy lifting snake eyes over his shoulder, taking him into the uh, plane, him there in the sort of the bandages. Um, then, then we get a little bit of uh, extra sequences with um, snake eyes in, in hospital with, um, Tommy and uh, Stalker before that uh, that famous uh, sequence again from issue twenty six of framed slightly differently uh, of Snake Eyes waiting at the at the airport before um, receiving the terrible news from Hawk who uh, calls himself Clay which is a little bit jarring I don't remember him ever calling himself that before but there we are yeah so then we get to this final page where he actually says, my name is Clay Abernathy. And uh, he delivers the bad news. And it it hits, it lands a little differently because he's doing it in word balloons in dialogue in the scene. Whereas, mm-hmm. as I recall in issue 26, uh, is it is it Hawk who's narrating the scene to yeah. Stalker in the present day? That's right. So we see similar panels or the same panels. Uh, and here we are, in the scene as it plays out, as opposed to witnessing a flashback in the original Marvel issue. Another um, movie reference uh, at the bottom of the final page, it says, next, Hearts of Darkness. And uh, Heart of Darkness is the story that Apocalypse Now is an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. But, you know, that's that's totally fair. Anyone who's making, uh, many people making a Vietnam set story you know, after Apocalypse Now and Platoon and Full Metal Jacket and Tour of Duty or, you know, China Beach or, you know, going to be, you, you live in a world where those are sort of part of the story. You know, if you make a crime story, you might on purpose or inadvertently make a reference to, you know, it's Godfather. So, uh, so that's the first issue. And then there's an ad for, uh, America's Elite and Evil Ernie and a new magazine called Lo-Fi. And then there's an ad for the uh, the premiere of Devil's Do's adaptation of the first Dragonlance novel. And there's even a three-page preview uh, from that. And uh, then there's an ad for some covers and an ad for some swords and an ad for a new Devil's Due book called The Lost Squad, and then the inside back cover is an ad for the America's Elite Data Desk Handbook, which is the book of profiles like G.I. Joe Order of Battle. And uh, and then the back cover, of you, as you mentioned, which is sort of a vignette of the issue two cover. So how do you how do you take this how do you take this first issue by itself, Mark? Huh. By itself. I th- I think I think the 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 thing that that you kind of nailed on the head for for me is the the somewhat hard comparison between this and the original material particularly the way that this leans so much into issues 26 and 43 which uh, are, you know some of my f- very favorites from that original run and just you know close to being perfect comics and and so it's a, a very hard comparison to make. 
I, th I think there's a point that you've made before, which is that you can just pick up this book and give it to someone that basically doesn't know anything about Snake Eyes or G.I. Joe at all. And it should then still in theory or make complete sense. And possibly that's that's a really good market or audience for it. I don't dislike it, but but I I, I don't know that there's there's enough new and exciting material there to, to make me uh, the biggest proponent of it. Um, I can separate myself enough that um, if I had never read the Marvel stuff, um, I think this comic would be compelling and exciting and uh, a good unit of, of comic, you know, 22 pages of, uh, you know, action and drama and, and some, some sad scenes, you know, leaving his family and um, innocence um, suffering and also um, friends getting injured and killed. Uh, but I, I can't separate it. And I, I, look forward to reading the rest of the miniseries because I'm looking for the 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 added bits that that do work well that do I don't even mean feel in keeping with the original because that's not that's sort of not the point for me I think I think in our next episode when we look at the remaining five issues I will be looking for um because you, you all now know my point of view on this, right? Like I can't separate it from the original material and I don't, and I like the original material much more. So I'll talk about that a little bit when we come back to this mini series, but how do I take this from the point of view of someone who hadn't read the original or had no particular, you know, love for the original? One of the reasons why I was so okay with writers taking over for Chris Claremont on X-Men and on Candy X-Men in 1991 is because I'd only been reading Uncanny X-Men for a year and a half and I didn't understand it because it was exciting and complicated. And I didn't know that Claremont had so, you know, much made it his own. And, you know, as long as the stories were good and it kept coming out, I was excited. Um, so I'm curious how this works on its own as a, as a, as a separate GI Joe miniseries, this like stack of six issues or this book, you could just hand someone who who does not have the marvel issues or has no particular association with them good so that's what we shall be doing uh next time uh we'll round out the uh brandon joa era of gi joe with those issues snake eyes declassified issues back over on the regular show i'm sure we'll be doing all sorts of other interesting things talking to interesting people and uh, if it's not yet out, we will have our episode 200 anniversary uh, episode, um, which I think, if, if all goes according to plan, will probably be the episode after this one. Um, so, Tim, uh, where can people find you when you're not talking to me about all things G.I. Joe? Video essays about television and film at our YouTube channel, Atomic abe productions my brick and mortar comic book shop is hub comics in somerville massachusetts and i write about gi joe at a real american book.com excellent and you can find out more about talking joe at the website which is talking joe.co.uk it's got all of the links to the audio podcast to youtube to twitter to instagram and to our facebook group where you can get involved in the discussion we're also on Patreon, patreon.com slash Talking Joe. So a big thanks to our backers, Richard, Sam, Jay, Bill, Christopher, Justin, Rob, Brian, and Shane, who are all getting early access to episodes as well as some exclusive content. The people on Patreon, Tim, they've been as much as three episodes ahead lately. So um, <laughs> if you want early content, that's the place to go. Um, but that is us done until next time. But until then, remember that nobody beats Talking Joe, an international podcast. Laters. This is the end. My